one of the greatest architectural inventions that the Romans gave us was the invention of the arch. And if you know anything about the arch, an arch is all held together by one single stone, the capstone or the keystone. And that stone, when it's put in place, strengthens all the other stones that they can reach out into each other and keep the whole thing sturdy. And from the arch, they quickly discovered if you elongate an arch, from that you create the vault. And so Romans were experts at the vault. And then if you take the arch and spin it on its axis, it creates the dome. And so a wonderful technological advancement in the creation of the arch. And again, the key of that was the keystone, or the capstone. Well, Jesus referred to himself as the keystone. The stone which the builders rejected has become the keystone. The stone that holds everything together. And indeed, Jesus does that for us. He is what keeps our lives together. He is what keeps or should be keeping our world together. And I'm convinced that so much of the problems we're facing in our world today is because many people, even people who would call themselves Christian, at least in name, have abandoned Christ and started seeing things not the way he does, but the way we think it should be done. And so they have taken the keystone out of its place, and when you do that, all the other stones no longer support each other, and it all falls apart. I'm convinced that if we simply put Christ back in, into the place where he belongs, then we'll have the stability and the strength and the world that we're meant to have, because Christ will be what is keeping all of us together. And of course, the most important part of that is the Eucharist, what we celebrate today in this great solemnity of Corpus Christi, the body and blood of Christ. Jesus gave himself to us as food, turned bread and wine into his own body and blood so that he could enter into us and we could be part of him. And the Eucharist completes everything. All the other sacraments, which are all one, all seven of our sacraments, are means by which we participate in the Paschal Mystery. The suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus is made truly present to us. And all of the rest of them come together because of the Eucharist. When we eat Jesus' flesh and drink his blood, he physically enters us, and we are now made part of him, and we become part of Christ. And it completes what we remember even at the Incarnation, if you can think all the way back to Christmas, when we talked about the Incarnation, that God himself became a man. He humbled himself to take upon our nature. God became a human, human being and then gave us his flesh and blood as our food so that we would be with him. And when Jesus rose and then ascended into heaven, he took his throne in heaven again. But now on his throne, he has a human body. And you and I are part of that human body every time we receive the Eucharist. So now we are called to be part of God himself, to be one with him, to be deified. God became man so that man could become God. And we become one with him, sharing all of his glory, the fullness of all beauty, all wisdom, all essence, all joy, all truth. You and I are called to be nothing less than absorbed into one in union with Christ. And all of that comes about because of the Eucharist. When we come to receive Jesus Christ truly present to us in his body and blood. And unfortunately, many denominations of Christianity have abandoned belief in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. And they think that we're merely receiving something that reminds us that Jesus, the night before he died, had a meal with his apostles. Well, no, the Eucharist is far more than that. As he said, do this in remembrance of me. That word remembrance in Greek is anamnesis. Do this in anamnesis of me. And the word means to make forever present. So Jesus saying, do this whenever you do it, to make what I'm now doing forever present for you. So what Jesus did with his apostles at the Last Supper continues every single time we come to receive the Eucharist. That over and over again, we are called back into unity with the Lord, our sins forgiven, and we are part of the keystone. We are part of the capstone that gives strength to all the other parts of the structure of the church and of the world. And we take our place with Christ in being part of the solution that everything, of everything that is wrong in the world. My brothers and sisters, I am convinced that the key to returning the world to the stability that we long for, and we're seeing as Christ has been taken out of the world, the world has gone into chaos, Communities get difference of opinions, fighting with each other, sometimes even violently to the point of burning down cities and shootings and all the other things that we're seeing. 
I'm convinced it would all come back together if we would only stop understand Christ and Christ truly present in the Eucharist. That every time we come here to Mass and receive His body and blood as our food, we are one with Christ and one with each other. And so we are called to go out now and be Christ continuously present in the world. And when we understand that, that we're taking God Himself as our food, and God is entering into us, that changes everything. We realize the dignity that is ours because we are now a physical part of Jesus, just as if we were actually on the cross with Him on Good Friday. That we are with Him in everything He did. We were there with Him in His incarnation. We were there with Him in all of His teaching. We were there when all of He worked all of His miracles. And most importantly, we were with Him when He suffered on the cross and died and was buried. And we were with Him, part of Him, when He rose from the dead. And we are now in a unique way with Him in His glory in heaven, which we will share in His fullness when our soul leaves this earth. And then on the new creation when Jesus returns and we will be drawn into total union with Him. Oh, my friends, what a wonderful gift we have to come here Sunday after Sunday and receive the Eucharist. I am again convinced that that is the answer to all the woes of people wondering why 75% of Catholics do not come to church anymore and why even a greater number of Protestants do not come to their communities because sometimes they're looking only for hype. They're looking for, in many places, just charismatic prayer for vibrant speakers and for people who touch their hearts and there's nothing wrong with that. We certainly want to do that. But forgetting that the most important part of the Mass is that we come to receive God himself as our food. And that even if the priest doesn't happen to be the best preacher in the world, and our music isn't the best, or whatever it may be, we come here to receive Christ. And that's all that matters. And maybe if we could start to understand that, we might talk less or cease calling, speaking about our Sunday Mass obligation, and start talking about our Sunday Mass privilege. What an honor and a privilege it is, and a blessing for us, to be able to be here, offering our duty before the Lord, but as the Eucharistic prayer says, our duty and our salvation to worship Him every Sunday. That in receiving the Lord, we are leading our souls to salvation in His kingdom. My dear friends, on this great solemnity of the body and blood of Christ, may we remember the tremendous gift that God has given us by giving us His body and blood as our food so that He can remain in us and with us and draw us into unity with Him each and every time we come to receive Him for all of our lives and indeed into all eternity as that when we come to Mass, we are receiving a foretaste of the Paschal Feast of Heaven. May Jesus Christ be praised. Now and forever. I had to keep my words a little shorter than normal this morning because I have to share with you some information that I know many of you have been waiting to hear. As you probably know, I'm in the last year of my second term as your pastor here, and normally that means at the end of your second term, the pastor has to move on to another parish. And the Cardinal did say that if there were extenuating circumstances, he would be willing to give a third term to a priest if they felt that there was a really good reason why he needed to stay there. And so, I mentioned that to you back in late January, early February, when they were looking for letters from the people to evaluate my performance here as your pastor. And many of you did write some letters to the, uh, to the Cardinal and the, uh, the Bishop, who is the head of priest personnel here in New York. And I'm happy to tell you that my evaluation went swimmingly. They had nothing but wonderful things to say about my performance here as your pastor and about St. Anne's and what we have become together as a parish. And they know very well that when I first came here 13 years ago, there were many people who were convinced that St. Anne's was seeing its final days, that this was our dying breath and we would you know, just simply be, soon be closed as a parish. But together we worked to revive the parish, and they know now we have built a strong and powerful parish uh, that is alive in Christ, and that they've even told me is a model for other parishes, that what we've done here, they would like other people to see and learn from so that they can learn to be strong again, as you and I are now. But at the time, they did mention to me that you know, they weren't sure because of the shortage of priests, and they had 65 pastors being evaluated at the same time, not all of them 12-year men. But given the shortage of priests, it is critical that we have each priest in the place where he is best going to work out to maximize his abilities to serve the church. 
And they reminded us that we're not ordained for any one particular parish, but the whole archdiocese, and that we need to be willing to go where we're needed. So I said to them, okay. I said, if I'm not to stay at St. Anne's, which is what the people want, um, please send me where you need me. But please promise me that if, you, if I am not to remain at St. Anne's, that you will send a pastor who will continue everything we've been doing. And everybody's biggest fear is that after I leave, everything we've accomplished would fall apart. And they promised me that they would not let that happen, that they would take good care of St. Anne's if I were not to stay here. But they told me it was going to take some time to see where everybody would be best be fitting and to decide whether or not I would continue here as your pastor or if they needed me elsewhere. And I was getting very antsy because week after week after week not hearing anything and knowing the starts would all be on July 1st. And I was trying not to be a nuisance, but I kept calling and texting the bishop and saying, I know you've got a lot on your plate, but any answer yet? Any answer yet? I'm going crazy here. And he told me, he goes, please just be patient until we have all the pieces in, in the position. And everything started to change about three weeks ago. Um, normally when this, when pats, uh, parishes are open for pastors, they send out a whole list and priests write in for whatever they'd like to do. But this year the Cardinal decided that he was going to personally plug in people. And on, of all the parishes that would be available, only six of them were advertised that any priest who wanted to write in to be a pastor of a parish could write in to be the pastor of that parish. And one of them was St. Peter's up in Monticello, in Sullivan County, the westernmost part of the diocese, and very few priests are willing to go there. So obviously I had nobody who was a perfect match there. And one priest who saw that and realized they needed somebody in, in Sullivan County, and they have really only one priest in the entire county who can work at full speed or you know, full time with all of his powers. He said, okay. He says, if you need me to go there, that was his home parish. He says, I know the area very well. Um, and even though it was not the end of his term, he was in midterm, uh, he, he was not up for evaluation and transfer, they accepted and they appointed him as the pastor uh, up in St. Peter's in Monticello. And some of you would know him. He was my classmate who was assigned here, Father Bob Papora, who was here as a newly ordained priest 30 years ago. So he left there. Uh, he agreed rather to accept the transfer there, and that left a gap in his parish. And so it turns out as they looked at it, because especially the people there, which is a much bigger parish than we have here, and they have a school and everything, they said, well, the people are going to be rather upset because they were not expecting Father to leave because it was not the end of his term. They thought that I would be the right person to fill the gap there and ease the parting blow on them. So they asked me, or basically told me, that my next assignment would be what it was. And so as of July 1st, I have been appointed pastor of the parish of St. Dennis in Hopewell Junction. And it's a, it's a much bigger parish than we have here. They have a school and they've told me they want, you to, they want me to go into the school and teach the children. And it makes sense to me because I realize, well, yeah, they're putting me in a place where I really belong. I'm going to be a real country pastor. So the street that's on is so quiet, I will not be hearing all the noise of Midland Avenue that every time I fall asleep in my chair and a, a truck beeps, and all of a sudden they're clawing me off the ceiling. So it'll be a lot quieter there. But it's a bigger parish, and it's got a lot of young families moving up there, and so it makes perfect sense. But they did not forget their promise to me about St. Anne's. And when they told me who was coming here, I breathed a sigh of relief, and I said, oh, thank you. I said, they've taken good uh, care of you. Unfortunately, because of protocol, I can't tell you the name of the priest yet, because I don't know if he's told his people yet that he's leaving different things. I haven't spoken to him and gotten the approval of the diocese to mention it. Once I get that permission, I will tell you, but I do promise you, you will love him very much. You might even love him more than you love me. So he's a great priest coming in that I know you will very much be thankful to have. And I know some people have been disappointed all morning when I'm telling them, I'm happy to hear that. You know, if I found out that everybody was celebrating and dancing in the streets because I was finally leaving, I might feel I did something wrong. There may be a few people like that, but most of you were very upset that I'm leaving, and that's heartwarming to me because I love you very much, and I'm happy to know how much you have loved me. And some people will say, well, all of those letters they wrote, were they for naught? Actually, no. The letters you wrote gave them a good understanding of exactly what's happened here at St. Anne's, what I was able to do, what you appreciated, and knowing where to place me uh, in the parish where they feel they would maximize my skills and abilities. And I think the parish of St. Dennis will be a perfect match for that. So I thank you for all of your letters because it helped them make the right replacement for me. 
So it means I have uh, three more weeks with you here, and I could be negative and just whine and complain that I have to move on, but we know that's part of life as a priest. We're not ordained for just one parish. We're ordained to serve wherever we're needed. And I actually squeeze an extra year in. Normally, it's supposed to be here for 12 years. I've been here 13 because they, my first term came up to, in the middle of making all things new when they were evaluating which parishes to keep open and close. So for one year, I was made an administrator. And then afterwards, when all of that was settled, then the pastor made, the department made me pastor for another six years. So I squeaked an extra year in that ordinarily I would have left a year ago. So um, I can complain about having to leave you, or I can rejoice to say I've had 13 beautiful years here with you. There are years that have changed me as a priest, that have filled me with so much joy, so many happy memories. I can tell you they have been the 13 most happy years of my life as a priest and as of my life in general. And I will always remember all the beautiful things and the people here at St. Anne. So we'll have a few more weeks to celebrate together. And then on June 30th, my last night that I'm officially here as your pastor, we're going to celebrate a solemn mass and Thanksgiving at seven o'clock here in the church. And we're going to have a reception over in the school auditorium. And thankfully, the COVID has relaxed so that we're able to do that. And I hope you'll all come out and we'll celebrate that evening and um, then have a nice party afterwards. And then, of course, if you just want to come up the line anytime and visit, it's only an hour right up the springs of the Taconic, and it's a mile right off the exit of Deepman Road. So I'll be happy to turn around one day and see a familiar face from St. Anne's there. So I thank you. I'll have a little bit more to say, obviously, at my farewell mass. But I want to thank God, and I want to thank you for the privilege of being your pastor these 13 years. I will never forget any of you, and I will take the memories that I have learned here and all of you in my hearts as I go on to my new parish. Thank you, and God bless all of you. Thank you.